I want to talk to you this morning about the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This passage, Romans 8, 1 through 11, is what we're going to look at. And it really, it speaks to three different groups of individuals. This passage has within it phraseology and instruction, so to speak, with three different uh, groups of individuals. The, uh, we'll read it first, then we'll go back and I'll unpack it for you. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness, righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, <clears throat> nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we see three groups of people that are in here. There's three groups of people in, this, in these 11 verses. Uh, Paul talks about the non-believer in these verses. He talks about the believer who thinks, acts, and lives as if he were a non-believer. It's called a carnal Christian. So he talks about the non-believer, and he talks about the believers who think and act and live out their lives as if they were not a believer. Number three, the third group of people are the believer who is in communion with the Holy Spirit and governing their life by what is called the law of the Spirit. So this is an individual who is, who is born again. So we have, we have the non-believer, and then we have two groups of the believer. Uh, we, have, we have the carnal Christian, we have the spiritual Christian. We have, the, we have those that are uh, know, the, name, the name of Jesus, but they still think, act, and respond, and live their life as if they weren't a believer. Uh, they're, they're living by their emotions. They're living by their perception of what they think truth is. Uh, they're living by their accumulated experiences of, of life. All of that is governing and shaping the way they live their lives, the way they interact with other individuals. But the individual who's fully committed to Jesus, the individual who is, who is putting on the new nature, the individual who is uh, giving themselves to the kingdom and has surrendered themselves to the lordship of Jesus, have made a clear transition from having Jesus as your savior and then having Jesus as your Lord. There's a lot of people that walk the planet that say they believe in Jesus and they receive them as their savior. And they say that, you know, that they're saved, that, that I'm a Christian, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. I think there's a smaller group that are serious about their relationship with Jesus and make that a high priority in their lives. And, they, and, and they're walking after the spirit, not after the flesh. They are, they are taking up their cross and following him. They are denying themselves taking up the cross and following Christ. They're all in. Turn to somebody and say, we need to be all in. You know, all of us know, all of us know people who, who name the name of Jesus, have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, right? You know, you know and it depends who they're hanging out with. You know, if you're hanging out with your carnal buddies, then you're acting carnal. If you're hanging out with the Christians, then you're using the proper language, and not using other language that you might be using with your other group that you hang out with, if you get what I'm saying. But you're using the Christianese, oh, praise the Lord, brother, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we need to be the same people no matter where we're at, saints. You know, we need, we need to be who we are. We need to grow up in Christ and be who we're, who we're called to be, no matter where we're at, no matter what the situation is. We need to be living a non-compromising life. 
complete no, no, having and whatever compromises you currently see in your life, you need to have a, a, an adherence towards them. That, that's a sense that I, my throat's messed up this morning. I have a <laughs> lifesaver. As soon as that dissolves, I'll, I'll kick into I'll kick out a granny gear in the first gear and I'll start going through the gears. I crunch it up, but I make all kind of noise. I spit it out, but it's too good. And I don't want to get rid of it. It's wintergreen. Sorry. I do the stuff that they write in books. Say, don't ever do this as public speaking. Don't drink water in front of people. You know, don't go. Don't have candy in your mouth. All that. I do it all. Stay in one put place. You know, so you're not a distraction. I'm not sure if they say that or not. I don't even, I don't even read those books. I'm just going to be me. I'm who Jesus made me to be, and I'm just going to, you know, you like it, hang around. If not, you know. I'm a preacher, not a performer. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at these three groups of people. Let's first, let's take a look at the non-believer. Look at verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8. Verse 7 says, because... The carnal mind is enmity. That word enmity means an opposition. It's hostile. The carnal mind is hostile to the spiritual mind. It's, it's a, the carnal, carnal mind is actually in opposition, hostility against God, as it says right here. For it is not subject to the law of God. See, someone who has a carnal state of mind is in a carnal state of being. Uh, a person who's not born again, who does not have the spirit of God, they, have, they don't have the capacity to think kingdom thinking. They don't have the capacity to have the Holy Spirit govern their lives because they're, they're void of the Spirit. You know, if you didn't have a million dollars, you don't have a million dollars to give away. You know, if I said, hey, no, how about, how about you know, spotting me a million dollars till next week, I'll give it back to you. You know, it's past rich, I don't have a million bucks. You know, don't have, don't have it to give you. So if you don't have the Spirit, you can't expect, you know, we can never expect carnal people who are not born again to live according to kingdom principles, you know? I mean, if you have people, how many, we all have, you know, people that aren't, uh, you know, probably have non-believers. Anybody have non-believers in your family, your extended family? Okay, so you, you, can't, you can't hold them to the same standards you hold yourself to, because it's not possible for them to reach that, right? You didn't get to where you're at by your own efforts. If you did get to where you're at by your own efforts, then Christ, what's the purpose of the Spirit working in you and transforming you into the likeness of Jesus? You can't look like Jesus unless Jesus is in you to make you look like him. Okay? Because the carnal mind is, is a, hosp, a hostile in opposition against God, but is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh, see the phrase in, in the flesh, cannot please God. So what it's talking about here that are, is, in, are, is non-believers. It's talking about non-believers. Non-believers live their lives in opposition to the kingdom. Now, there's lots of non-believers that are moral, nice people, loving people, self-sacrifice, do those, kind, those kinds of things. But they're not, their mind and their spirit is not, is not in a place where it's in harmony with, with the kingdom principles. It's not in harmony with God. You know, for one thing I can tell you for sure is, you know, our mind is... The number one thing that we have to bring into submission to the Lordship of Jesus is the mind goes, so goes you. You know, that's really what it is. I mean, it's, it's the governor, the governor of our, of our lives governs our lives. So you see, he's talking about non-believers who are, look at the phrase again, in the flesh. Okay. Now, that means if you're in the flesh, that means the, the Holy Spirit's not in you in Bible terms. Sometimes we'll say that we'll use, we'll use the term, the person's in the flesh, to a believer who's acting carnally. A better phrase would be they're acting in the flesh. Because they're, they're not positioned in the flesh. If you're in the flesh, then you're positioned out of the kingdom. Okay, if you're in the spirit, that means the spirit's in you. That's why you're in the spirit is because he is in you. Okay, so then we see the believer. Uh, so we see the non-believer here. Okay, uh, okay the, so those, are, those who, are, who walk in the flesh, these are believers who position, uh, uh, ally, uh, 
positionally are in Christ. These are believers who positionally are in Christ because Jesus is in them. <clears throat> They've experienced conversion. They have the second birth. However, they are walking, talking, thinking, and acting as if they were non-believers. So let's talk about, let's see, see what this is. Uh, look, at, we look at verse 4. It's talking about a spiritual individual here. Verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but we walk what? According to the spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we see this contrast in believers between someone who is, who is thinking in the flesh and someone who is thinking in the spirit. Someone who, is in, who, someone who has engaged their entire being with the presence of the Holy Spirit that's in your life. That's an optional, that's optional. That's something that we have to do. That's something that we have to consciously do. We have to consciously be engaged with the Holy Spirit. Every one of us in this room can testify. We've made decisions without checking with the Holy Spirit for direction. The Bible says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Who in all, Acknowledge the Holy Spirit and what? <clears throat> He'll direct your paths. Has anybody in this ever room made a decision? How about just in 2023? Is there anybody made a decision in 2023, just one year ago, you know, in the last 365 days, without checking with the Holy Spirit, you made a decision and it wasn't a good, it was come to find out it wasn't a good decision. Yeah, look at that, almost everybody in the room has raised their hand. So that's what I'm talking about, walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. Now, um, so, you know, we see these two kind of things here. Um, look at verse Corinthians, turn, keep right there, we're going to come right back to Romans. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Keep your thumb in Romans. We're going to come right back to it. Or if you're fancy like me, I got a ribbon here. It came with the Bible. Got me an old fancy ribbon. Flip it right over there and keeps it. Come right back to it. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. This is the Apostle Paul addressing the carnality that's within the Corinthian believing church. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but to ask carnal, as, for, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For, for, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behave like mere men? So it's very clear here in this passage, he's talking about believers who have strife, have envy, have division. They're, they have carnal minds. They, they, they're, they're born again. What did he, how did he start off saying this? What's it, what's it say? Third word over. I, brethren, he's calling them brothers. So he's speaking to believers. Paul doesn't call non-believers brothers. He say, brethren, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual individuals. I had to speak to you as carnal because you're carnal. You're babes. You should have been, if you go on and read more, he says you should be eating meat by now, but you can't, you know, because you haven't even got the basic rudimentary principles of the kingdom functioning in your life yet. You know, so we have this group of individuals here that are acting, behaving like mere men. So that's a really clear indication as to what it means to be, uh, be a carnal, carnal court, uh, Christian. Okay, usually when you have carnal Christians, they'll fall into one of two categories. One of the first category is newly converted individuals, just as a newborn babe. Newly converted, you cannot expect instant sanctification of soul for a new convert. Old believers sometimes very unfairly expect a new believer to instantly become as holy as they are, or should I say they think they are. We forget, we forget what it looked like years of activity, applying ourselves to the word, Holy Spirit, fellowship, teaching, prayer, Submission to the Lordship of Christ to achieve the level of maturity. So, saints, we need to have, I have a high level, I have a high level of tolerance for uh, spiritual immaturity and spiritually immature people. Have high, you, know, you can't expect someone who's lived their life for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, <clears throat> living their life as a natural man, not even engaged in the things of the Spirit at all, they become born again, 
The moment they become born again, your spirit man, your spirit woman becomes 100% holy. Because the Holy One comes into you, the Holy Spirit. He joins himself to your unholy spirit, and he makes, your, he makes you unholy person. He makes you holy in your spirit man. Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. We are spiritually bankrupt without hope prior to our conversion. Jesus comes and he imputes his righteousness to us. He imputes his justification becomes a part of us. And we become, our spirit is joined with his spirit. We become the adopted sons and daughters of God. Now that's your spirit man. Now the problem is your soul man is a mess. Because for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you've been doing what you want to do, when you want to do it. You've been living by your emotions. You've been living by your feelings. You've been living by the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life, these kinds of things. And it's going to take some work for, that, some, for your mind that's corrupted, all screwed up, to become transformed. You know, your mind has to become transformed. Your, your soul has to be healed. Your soul has to be brought to light. There's all kinds of darkness in your soul when you become born again. And that soul has to be exposed to the light of God's word. Jesus is the light of life. He's the light of men. And Jesus wants to come into your soul and transform you so you look like him. So you start thinking like him. You know, the way you look like him, it's not a physical appearance, but it's the countenance. Scripture talks about the countenance. Countenance is what's being demonstrated outwardly, what's happening inside. Right? When you're depressed, everybody can see it on your face. Right? When you're happy, everybody knows you're happy because they can see it on your face. You know, it's, it's, it's what your face is shining. So what your, being is, your, what your being is portraying. So we're called as believers to grow up in Jesus and look like Jesus, think like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, and do it supernaturally by our supernatural nature. So it becomes natural. You know, it, has to, it becomes natural to where, you know, you forget those things in, in the past and, you, and you're, you don't even have the mindsets that you had before. Most believers, when they first get saved, they struggle hugely. How many of you struggled hugely with the temptation to go back to the sinful things that you did prior to your conversion? Yeah, because you haven't learned any new ways to walk in yet. You, know, you, you have a stronghold there. All you know is how to do life by the way you did it before. Now there's a new and living way for us to walk in. We have to walk in it. We have to walk it out. We have to apply it to every area of our lives. And the more you apply to it, the more you put into it, it's like anything, guys. It's like anything. If you get, how many of you got Planet Fitness for, what is it, $10 a month? You signed up for New Year's Eve or a New Year's resolution. I'm going to the gym. I'm going to work out, right? Planet Fitness and all that. You get that for 10 bucks or whatever you go. But if you don't go there, you're not going to get any benefit from it. You know? People join the, oh, I belong to a gym. Yeah, and they get their bellies way out here like this, you know, and they're it's just like, you know, they have a hard time picking themselves up off the chair, let alone picking up any weights or anything, you know. You know, it's, oh, I, I belong to the gym. Well, you need to apply your membership and go get active. Christians need to apply their membership into the kingdom of God and fully take all the benefits that are part of your membership in Christ and apply it to your life. And man, you'll, become, you'll be revolutionized. You'll be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. People start saying, dude, something happened to that guy. They'll, they'll look at you. They'll look at you like Caiaphas, the high priest, and all of his entourage. They looked at Peter and James and said, we perceive that these are unlearned men. Just common, ordinary men, not educated like us, not at all. But we perceive that they've been with Jesus. Because they walked in boldness, they walked in confidence, they knew who they were in Jesus. And, and, and they stepped in that reality and functioned in that. Because these guys said, we forbid you to preach to Je in Jesus' name. And he said, who's it better? Peter said, who's it better, to obey God or obey man? This is the same guy that said, crucify Jesus. And let go, Bar let Barabbas go. Same individual, same little group of, of uh, you know, power, power guys, whatever you want to call them. He looked them right in the face. Jesus makes all the difference in the world, guys. So we have new believers. We need to give them, we need to give them grace, guys. We need to love them. We need to encourage them. We need to not judge them. You know, this is a bad thing that the mature Christians... Older Christians will do. If you've been in the, in the Lord for a, year, for a while, you say to somebody, Oh, you're still doing that? Just quit. I did. Yeah, but you forgot to tell them it took you like nine months or 
or of fasting once a week and praying and begging or whatever until you finally got over that particular thing. You never even talk, talk, talked about the process. We expect them to instantly begin to behave that way. Instantly clean up your language. Instantly clean up your act, all, all your stuff. You know, totally, you know, all that transformation should occur instantaneously. It's not. Sanctification of spirit happens instantly. Sanctification, the word sanctification means to be set apart for the purposes of God. The soul is an ongoing process of sanctification that never ends. As long as you are trapped in your physical body and your soul is in your physical body, we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, we're being transformed in the image of Jesus. In Christianity, you either grow or you die. There's no cruise control. There's no, I got my fire insurance paid, my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, uh, you know, got my will, Last Testament written up, and I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back or waiting to check out. You know, that's not the case at all. You need to be grown. The Bible says, Jesus, I'm gonna, when, I, when I return, will I find faith? When I return to the earth, will I find faith? And faith isn't just a belief system. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is faith. Faith without works is dead. You got to have the works to prove that you have faith. The Apostle Paul says, you, you have faith. I don't see any works. Look at my works and you'll know I have faith by the works that I do. By this shall all men know that you're truly my disciples. How? That you have love one for another. So if you're not functioning in love, if you're not manifesting love out of your life, then, then it's questionable what's going on here. You know, is he really in you? Are you really in him? He's in you if you're born again, but are you in him? So we have that. So, so we need to, just as a newborn baby is born, we don't expect a, we don't expect a brand new baby, born baby to, you know, like two weeks later, do its own laundry, change its own diapers, be potty trained, wash the dishes after they make something to eat. No, we get this long process before that person's, you know, and then what, as they grow, they get more and more responsibility and more and more then eventually, by the time they reach a teenager, you should hope that they'd be, at least be able to like flush the toilet when they're done, you know, and maybe pick up their clothes instead of leaving them strung all the way down the hallway, you know, maybe even, maybe even like put the milk away after they pour it. That would really be a remarkable event that, they would do things like that, you know. You expect some, you expect some, some, uh, uh, see, so yeah, some maturity out of their out of their lives. Okay, the other one, the other group of immature believers, someone who has has been a Christian for a long time, long period of time, but they are essentially a baby Christian. They have not grown up in Jesus. They still think, act, talk, and are involved in activities that are contrary to the way of the Spirit. Their lives do not reflect the character and heart of Jesus. So sometimes it's not entirely their own fault. If they're in a church that isn't preaching the word of God, if they're in a church that isn't calling people to responsibility, calling people into spiritual maturity, uh, then, then what are you going to get? You know, if you just get you know, milk delivered to you all the time, then you're going to stay, your teeth are going to rot because you're not supposed to be drinking milk when you're an adult, right? If you're just getting fed that, then you're, then you're, 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 gonna, you're in a bad way. But some of it's by, just by your own design. It's by their, by, by, by their own choices. They want the pleasures of this world, and they want the, the promises of eternal life. So they'll, they'll live for the devil while they're on the planet Earth and hoping to live for Jesus when you're in eternity. And it don't work that way, guys. It doesn't work that way. Okay, let's look at those that walk in the Spirit. Let's go back to Romans 8. Flip back to Romans 8 if you didn't already do that. <clears throat> Romans 8, first two verses right here, and first two verses of Romans 8. I just got a, caught somebody. Hi, Linda. Nice to see you. Linda's back from Florida. I looked back and I thought, Linda's here. You know, we're, they're in Florida. But she likes church so much, she flew up here just for today because she missed Pastor Rich's teaching and flew all the way from Florida here. I think, I think she probably had enough of Ken. She needed a break. That's why she came back. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> He's probably watching. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. This is so powerful, saints. So we're talking about... Those that are in Christ. Remember, let's look, let's look at verse 7 again. Look at verse 7. 
It says there, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to God, the law of God, for neither can be. So, I'm sorry, verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We already determined that being in the flesh means that you're not in Jesus, and Jesus isn't in you. You are, you are positioned outside of the kingdom, not as a, as a non-believer, okay? So we see, this thing, we see this thing here as well. Look at verse 8, second line. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are what? In Christ. That means Christ is in you and you're in him. Okay, so this is positional. Getting this? You know, you can act a certain way, but it's not who you are. You can be a Christian and, and act carnally, you know, and how quickly you, you know, what you do with that, we're going to get to that towards the end of the message. What you do with the carnal aspects of your life determines a lot of things. We're, we're going to look at that. But I want to talk about the position. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. Scripture talks about Christ being in you. He's the hope of glory. Uh, Colossians 1, you have to turn there. I'll read it. Colossians 1, verses 26 to 27. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. That's us, saints. It's been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, you know, being born again, Christ is in you. If you're born again. If you're not born again, then you're, not, then, then you're in the flesh, you're not in Christ. So the first step you've got to do is you've got to become born again. Uh, God's, it's very clear. You've got to be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see nor can enter the kingdom of God. Um, there's got to be a, if you want to overcome the second death, which is hell, then you need to have the second life. The second birth, you know, we have a physical birth. We have physical death. We need to have a spiritual birth so that we can have spiritual life. Life now as well as life for, life for eternity. And it's available to everybody. God desires that all men everywhere would repent. That's his desire. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You know, uh, God is no respecter of person. He'll take you. Jesus said, I'll never, if you come to me, I will not turn you away. There's nothing you can do that will cause Jesus to reject you. The only thing you can do is walk away from him or reject him. He stands at the door of our heart and he knocks at the door of our heart, asks to come in. In context, he's speaking to the not, he's speaking to believers. In Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If you will open up the door, I'll come in and have fellowship with you. So he's talking about believers who are basically carnal. They're not, they're not engaged in fellowship with the Lord. But it applies for non-believers as well. There's two, there's two principles we can see here in these first two verses. There is a law of the spirit. I'll talk about that here just in a second. But the other part is in the very, very beginning. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. So, saints, if you recognize what it means to be a man and a woman of God and follow after the Lord, and that's, that's your life's purpose goal is in your heart to do that, that everything that you, that you live and move and have your existence in him, that you live to glorify Jesus, that you live that you might be a reflection of him, that you might bring his love, his life, his health, his the spirit of God into your own personal life, into your immediate family's life, and into whatever area and situation that you can, that you can be, that your, your, your goal is to become a, a river of living water, John chapter 7, so that you can be a spiritual source for others. If that's what you're, if that's what you're about, if that's in your heart, then there's no condemnation to you. For when you fail, when you come up short, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But now if you're a carnal individual, and you're living for yourself, you're not living for others, and you're still, you're born again, you know Jesus is your Savior, but you're still only concerned about yourself, and the three most important people in your life is me, myself, and I, you know, and that's your three most important people in your lives, in your life, then there's going to be condemnation. There's going to be, there, there's, a, there's just a judgment by your own actions, you know. You know you're violating your conscience. You're, violate, you're, you're, you're uh, grieving the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. No, we need to be, we need to be conscious that we don't, 
violate our conscience to the part that, that we don't even have a sense of it any longer. People become pathological liars. Not, they're not born pathological liars. They become pathological liars because they've lied so much that they, their conscience has been seared with a hot iron and they no longer feel holy, and they don't, no longer feel just the human spirit consciousness that Holy Spirit, there's, there's, a more, there's a universal morality that is like programmed into the human being. There's missionaries that have gone, not anymore because most all the remote areas, there's still some remote areas, but most all the remote areas of the world have been reached in some way or another with the gospel. But there's been missionaries years ago that have gone in the middle of the, middle of the Amazon jungle and found this whole tribe of people that were living their lives like you think they were Christians. They have monogamous relationships. No one, no one ever murdered anybody. There wasn't any thievery going on. There was like this peace and harmony that was there. They worshipped usually their ancestors or something like that. They, 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 no one ever impacted them for the kingdom. They weren't, they weren't reached by Jesus, but they were, they were living a very moral lifestyle that you, in all intents and purposes looked like it was a Christian lifestyle. Why is that? There's a universal principle that is, uh, Ecclesiastes 3.16 says that eternity is written in our hearts. You know, we're spiritual beings, guys, having a temporary physical existence. If our spirit being is eternal and our physical being is only temporal, don't you think we ought to put some attention to the spirit part? I mean, a whole lot more. That's going to last forever. That's going to last forever. This is just temporary, temporary down here. Yeah, take vitamins, eat right, exercise, do all that stuff. Take care of your vessel so that it can serve you well. Hopefully, not so that you can just be carnal with your vessel, but that you can serve the Lord a long time with your vessel. I try to take care of this thing because I'm no, you know, I want to be healthy and vibrant. And I want to go out on, on, on my feet, not just on my feet, but running when I check out. You know, that's what my, what my goal is. Why? So I so that I can be effective minister, ministering to others. So I could be an, effect, an effective representative of Jesus. You know, so there's this, where was I going with that? Look at my notes, figure out where I'm at. Yeah, condemnation part. We all fail. You know what, I use this terminology for myself. When I slip back to a carnal response, you know, when I find myself functioning in the flesh, acting in the flesh, acting, reverting back to the default mode that, that I was in for, stuck in for 22 years before I became a believer. When I find that happening, I very quickly want to get out of that situation because it is not good for anybody. It's not good for me. It's not good for Kathy. It's not good for anybody in any way, what, what shape or form. So I very quickly, you know, uh, what's the thing when you catch on fire, stop, drop and roll? You know, kind of a thing. So when that happens, I stop, you know, and I, you know, roll with the Holy Ghost. I get to engage with the Holy Spirit to see what the heck's going on here. And I, I want to determine whether there's something in my heart that's bringing this out that hasn't been brought under the submission, the Lordship of Jesus yet. Or is it just a temporary lapse of my identity? You know, you have a temporary lapse of who you are in Christ. You know, I am the righteousness of God. You are. You can say what I'm saying. You can say to yourself, because this is what the Bible says, guys. You know, I am an able minister of the New Testament. I am a minister of reconciliation. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am a son of God. You go through, go through those kinds of things. That's who we are. That's who we are in Jesus. That's having the kingdom perspective of ourselves. So when we act like a jackass, it's because we forgot who we were. And we're not acting like who we were and what we're called to. So sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, figuring, figuring that thing out. If you see, re, see that same kind of thing repeating, then usually there's something that deeper in there. It's not just a temporary lapse of identity. It's not just stresses and strains and whatever irritableness and whatever that made you snap that way and made you, made you act that way. But there's something a little bit deeper needs to be rooted out. Some area of your, maybe that you haven't submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Maybe some wound of the past that needs some healing. That's why free to bees are huge, guys. We, we talked about free to bees. It's a ministry we have here at the church where we can help you help root out some of those things that are strongholds in your soul and some wounds from the past. There's brochures on the table. You'll call Kathy and Kathy will organize and set that up for you. It's, it's very powerful. How many of you have had a free, free to be and found it worth, worth doing? Quite a few. Yeah, it's quite a few. 
So just a little plug there for the free to be ministry. Uh, hmm? You're welcome. It's, it's well worth doing. That's why I put in the devotional, in our 21-day devotional. I said, we're fasting and praying. Why not schedule free to be? Only one person in the congregation took us up on that. Uh, have that done. It's a great time. It was when you're concentrated, uh, seeking the Lord. I hope that you stepped up your, I hope that during the 21 days that we just finished last week, that you stepped up your uh, devotion to the Lord and your, your Bible reading. We had the TV off. It was great. I, I had uh, my uh, little rectangle. My battery was like, 90% at the end of the day. It's amazing. You don't have to watch videos all day long. It doesn't drain down to 3%. And you got to plug it in before the day's out, you know. So my phone was up. You know, my phone had a break. It was really liking it, too. Okay, so. Um, how about this, guys? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. There isn't anything that you can do that will change God's love for you. You could be, you could go on a, a flesh binge, you could go on some kind of, a, kind of a carnal rampage, and God's love for you is not changed. Whether or not you are well-pleasing in the Lord's sight is conditional. How many of you love your kids unconditionally? And you love, you know, how, many, how many of you, there's been times when your kids were not well-pleasing? Did it, did it change your love for them? No, you still love them. Yeah, you know. And sometimes your, your heart even hurt because you know the choices they're making are taking them down the wrong path. The choices they're doing is hurting themselves, and you know there's a better way. So your, your love even increases more because they're, they're, because they're being, they're choosing the narrow, they're the wide path and the wide gate, you know, and you're, so, so love is even increased, but they're, but they're not well-pleasing, you know. What we're, what, we're, what we're supposed to be living our lives for so that when we hear, when we leave this planet and we stand before the judgment seat, that we're going to hear this, well done, good and faithful servant, well done, which means what? You pleased him with your life. You know, I want to please him with my life. You know, so there's choices that we make. There's things that we do that are, is whether or not we're going to end up being well-pleasing. It isn't going to affect your salvation, but it's going to affect, it's going to affect your, your standing with the Lord in the sense of whether or not you're a faithful servant or not. Okay, let's turn to this. Turn to, turn to Galatians chapter 5. I had more to say in Romans, but it's getting late. I need to move on. Let's go to, go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16. Galatians 5. I'm going to read verses 16 to 26. Ten verses. Paul says this. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things, those who have a lifestyle that is engaged with those kinds of things. It doesn't say if you do that one time that you're going to be, that you're not going to be able to inherit the kingdom of God. But it's, but it's, we'll get to this in a minute, but it's vitally important that when we find ourselves sowing to the flesh of the flesh we're going to reap corruption that we immediately get that thing taken care of navigate away from that and go back to the spirit okay we'll go we'll get back to that in a second verse 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law and those who are christ's have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. If you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we see this. We see this, these two things. We have the fruit of the flesh. We listed them. We have the fruit of the spirit. Now, so what's interesting is both of these things manifest themselves from two different natures. The first ones manifest themselves from the nature of our, of, of our human nature. We were born with sin. We have a, a natural propensity to want to do what's wrong. It's what's within us. Don't believe me? Look at a two-year-old. I mean, you have to deal with a two, two-year-old or three-year-old. They want their way when they want it. They'll bite, they'll kick, they'll scratch, they'll scream, they'll drag their feet. They won't do what you want them to do. You tell them some simple thing not to do, and they're going to do what? They're going to exercise their rebellious spirit. It's, going to, it's pretty clear that person, infants don't get born again at age two or three, but I mean, that's what needs to happen to, to, you know, to correct that. It's interesting, psychologists say that, if, that the personality of a child is, is established by the age of three. By the age of three, whatever that, however that child responds and interacts, so if you have a mean bully kind of a child, by the, and, and they're still that way when they're three years old, they're going to end up being a mean bully child all pretty much throughout the rest of their life. They're going to have to deal with that. And as they get born again and get that thing redeemed and get it under the blood of Jesus and all that. That's why it's so important to, to uh, you know, train up a child in the way that he should go so that when he gets old, he'll, he'll go in that way. You know? so, so it's huge. So you have that, that, the carnal nature. Those things come, come from the carnal nature. Then you have these things that come from the spirit nature, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is not something that you can manufacture. The works of the flesh is something that just generates itself from your ungenerated uh, being, from your, from your unredeemed part of, your, part of yourselves. Okay? It, you know, some of it's willful. About Romans chapter 8, further down, the Apostle Paul says, the things that I want to do, those things I can't find myself doing, the good things, the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I find myself continuously doing them. Who's going to deliver me from this body of sin and death? Next verse, he says, I thank God that Christ Jesus has, present tense, delivered me. So Paul was talking about his nature prior to his conversion and in his lordship to Christ. You know, and he, was, he had the law. This dude was like a brilliant scholar, Hebrew scholar. He had, the, he had most of the Old Testament memorized. I mean, he, was, he, was, he had multiple PhDs in Judaism. And yet he had the sin nature that he couldn't manage. Why? Because you can't manage sin. You know? You go, to, you go to secular psychologists and secular counselors, you know, secular whatever, they, want, they try to teach you principles on how to manage your life, how to control it. You need to get a new nature. You know, I don't, want to, I don't want to manage my old nature. I want a new nature. I thank God that Jesus gave me a new nature when I got born again. It's a new and living way. Forgetting those things that are behind, I'm pressing forward to the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. That's what is there. You want to become a new person? You know, don't try to manage your, 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 put it to death. Put your old nature to death and allow your new nature to be dominant in your, in your life. So we see this. So here's, here's some, here's a couple, couple other verses. Verse, Ephesians 4.24 says, put on the new man. Put on the new man. That's an action. They're telling you to do something. Put on the new man. Put it on you. Put your jacket on. It's cold outside. What do you do? You put one sleeve, you unzip it, whatever, you take it off the hanger, one arm, one arm, one arm, zip it up, you know, make sure you get your hat and scarf or whatever, and you're putting on. It's very intentional. It's an action that you do. It doesn't say, let me put your jacket on you. Let me put the new nature on you. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, put on the new, put on the new man, which after God is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.10, and having put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. This word renew means to, to uh, renovate, to remodel. So, so our, our, our new man is renovating, remodeling us, putting this on. So it's an action that we take part in. The Bible says if we sow to the flesh, of the flesh will reap a corruption. If we sow to the spirit, of the spirit. Sow just means to plant, right? If you plant corn in your, in your garden, what are you going to get? Corn, you know, if you plant uh, poison ivy in your garden, what are you going to get? You know, poison ivy. Don't, don't, some Christians want to plant poison ivy and reap corn. It isn't going to happen. What you, what, you sow, you, you know, what you sow, you reap. So here's six quick things you can do 
to make the transition, to aid, to prevent yourself from slipping into, back into becoming a carnal Christian, or if you're in the carnal Christian state, uh, moving towards being, being a spiritual man, <clears throat> or if you're an infant, you know, young in the faith, how to accelerate your growth. You know, if you go to the gym, I'll use that in an analogy again, you can go over there and try to figure it out yourself, how to, you know, how to work the machines. Or whatever. I don't go to the gym, so I don't know what kind of machines there is. You, know, you work the machines and the treadmills and the weights and all that other jazz and figure out what muscle groups need to be worked on or whatever. Or you can go get a trainer. He looks at you and figures out what you know, your body mass and this and that or whatever and what weights you need and finds out what your goals are, what you want to look like. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, by the end of two weeks of workout, I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? And some of the young people are looking like, who's that, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? <laughs> he's still alive, so he's not like too old yet, you know? I mean, the guy's still alive. Whoever else, I don't know, whoever is a muscle builder guy's now, you know? And, and they, you know, they put you on the fast track, you know, so you're able to get into shape. So here's the, here's the fast track to be able to get into shape spiritually and to make sure that you don't, sl don't get out of shape spiritually and go back to being a, a carnal individual. Number one, you need to confess sin. It's very vital. You need to confess sin. Whatever sin is in your life that you currently are aware of, you need to confess it. When the Holy Spirit brings something, quickens something to your mind, you need to not compromise, not tolerate. Well, that's not that bad. It's not hurting anybody. No, it's hurting you. If it's hurting you, it's hurting the Holy Ghost. And if it's hurting you and hurting the Holy Ghost, then it's hurting your family. If it's hurting you and the Holy Ghost and your family, then it's hurting you and the Holy Ghost and your family and the body of Christ. Amen. Well, for which you are my brother and my sister, so you're hurting me. And if I don't do it right, I'm going to hurt you. So, there, so there's this, there isn't this. We're connected, guys. We're connected. We're one spirit. We're one body. What you do has an impact upon others around you. We're supposed to be a living letter, known and read of all men. You know, we're supposed to be, that's who we're supposed to be. So it's vitally important. Unconfessed sin becomes a stronghold. The Bible talks about besetting sins. A besetting sin in the Bible is a sin that you, don't, you, that you tolerate in your life. It's a sin that you compromise on and you allow this to come, in, come into this. I've had people say to me, you know, they're living in some type of sin. They're engaged in this kind of sin. And the, uh, they'll say to me things like, oh, God's just going to have to cut me some slack on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. You know, so, so you know what those things are. What will happen is this, guys. Multiple things happen. If you allow yourself to sin and you don't bring it to the blood of Jesus, you're not serious about getting this thing ratified, then what's going to happen is you'll get a stronghold of sin in your life. Not only that, but you will develop a dull of hearing of the Holy Spirit. There's been people who said to me, I can never hear from the Spirit. I try your soap stuff. I try all these things I can't hear from the Spirit. And I root around and talk a little bit and find out they're living all kind of compromises in, in their lifestyle. Well, no wonder. You're, you've grieved the Holy Spirit. You can't. You know, the Holy Spirit has told you about your sin and you shut off your ear to him. So now you want an answer. So you're supposed to like turn your ear on. And he's supposed to say, OK, yeah, sure, I'll talk to you now. You want to talk. You want some kind of insight. You want some wisdom or something. But you don't want to give up this over here. The Bible says that sin separates us from God. You know, and I'm not talking about losing our salvation. I'm talking believers right now. I'm talking about believers who are living in compromising situations that is hindering your spiritual growth. It's impacting all of you. So you have this sin that becomes a stronghold, that besetting sin. You know what besetting is? It's like concrete. Any, anybody ever do concrete sidewalks or whatever? You put your rubber boots on and the truck comes and slops that stuff in there and you're walking, sloshing through the concrete, right? And you're trawling and you're, and you're leveling and you're floating it and all that kind of stuff. And then you get off of it. Well, if you stay in that concrete till the morning, guess what? You're stuck, dude. You're stuck. You need to get out of there. So when you get into sin, you need to get out of there before it becomes concrete. How about this? Anybody ever lay blocks or bricks or stone before? You, when, you, when, you, when you mud up bricks, you take a, say we're building a, a block wall. You have block and you have your, your mortar mix, okay, and you, you, you trowel down your mortar. You put your blocks on, you build the wall. Okay, so you build a wall this high, okay? One day you got this wall built this high. Come back the next morning and you look at the thing and you sight it and you're thinking, dang, that doesn't look right. And now you break out the laser level that you had in the truck all along, which is the standard by which you're supposed to measure things, right? You bring it out and you set it up and you find out this, it's two inches low here and it's three inches high over here. 
I can't build a house on this thing. Well, guess what? The good news is you just laid this the day before. You just stick your hand in the web of each of the blocks at the top, and you wiggle it about four times, and that block comes right off. You take your trowel, and you knock off the mortar, and you tear the whole wall down because it hasn't beset it yet. It hasn't set up yet. You messed up. You messed up, but within 24 hours, you have 24 hours to take that wall down without it breaking. You wait a week, you're going to, you're going to D&G Reynolds getting a jackhammer and busting that thing up because there's no taking it. Every block is going to be destroyed because it's now become set and hard. That's the same thing it is with sin. That comes into your life, do not tolerate. You need to have zero tolerance for sin in your life. Zero, do not allow your, the devil to talk you into compromising in some way that it's okay that you have this little pet sin. Okay, because it becomes besetting. And it will defile many. Number two, you need to forgive others. And it's the same way. Don't let 24 hours. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Why? Because the longer you wait when there's unforgiveness, the stronger it becomes in your life. The more you mull it over, and now you need a jackhammer to get that thing down. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness. Bitterness leads to defilement. Bitterness leads to judgment. Leads to self-justification and self-righteousness. If you hold unforgiveness in your heart, you'll develop a self-righteous attitude. That person owes me. They hurt me. They owe me this. So I am righteous. They are unrighteous. Before you know it, that, un- that self-righteousness spills into every relationship that you have. No one can do anything right. No one can be like me. It's my way or the highway. So a so self-righteous attitude. The Bible says that when we, when we trust in our own self-righteousness, that we make, the right, we make the righteousness of Christ to have no effect. So we can cancel the righteousness of Jesus. I'm telling you what, there's going to be more people in hell at the end of, at the, end of the age uh, for holding for self-righteousness than there is for people that were bound in some kind of sin they couldn't get out of. Number three, we need to esteem others better than ourselves. This is the law of the Spirit, Romans 12, 1, the law of the Spirit. This law of the Spirit doesn't mean, the, you know, the law, when, you, when the Bible talks about the old law, the old covenant law, I'm not talking about just the Ten Commandments, it's talking about the whole body of what is in, what has been communicated in the whole Old Testament, okay, the Old Covenant. So the law of the Spirit is the full embodiment, full embodiment of what it means to be a person in, in, in the Spirit of God. It brings new life, brings regeneration, righteousness and peace, enjoying the Holy Spirit, love, forgiving others. We love him because he first loved us. He poured his love into our hearts, us pouring the love out of his heart. It's all the way, it's the fruit of the Spirit being manifest in our lives. It's the full work of Holy Spirit in the, in the redeemed person's life. You know, we need to get in cooperation with that, saints. We need to put that on. We, it's a choice that we have to make every single day, every situation, every circumstance. We're faced with a circumstance. We can either, re, we can either react in the flesh or we can choose to do what? Respond in the spirit. It's us. It's our choice. And if you re- react in the flesh, get it fixed as quickly as you can. Don't let that offense that occurred as a result of you acting in the fence. Flesh, go down. Don't let the sun go down. Don't get it taken care of before the end of the day. Uh, I think it's Acts 24. The Apostle Paul said, I exercise myself daily to have a consciousness, mental, mental state consciousness, which is void of offense towards God, and towards man. So Paul exercises himself to make sure that I'm not holding any kind of ill will towards God, disappointment towards him or anything, and this as well. Daily. He says he does that daily. Keep short, keep short offenses, guys. Keep them short. Get them under the blood of Jesus. Esteem others better than yourself. It's the way of the law of the Spirit. Number four, transform your mind through reading and studying God's Word. You are not going to go anywhere in your spiritual walk if you're not reading the Bible. You're going to be stuck where you're at. You're going to be carnal. Oh, Pastor Rich, I don't like to read. I like like this. No excuses, guys. Come on. There's so many resources out there. You know, watch the super book. Watch uh, Veggie Tales, cartoon stuff, and get kingdom principles from there if you can't read the Bible. I mean, get, at least get started there. There's so many apps you can have the Bible being read to you. 
There's so many translations, you can get all kinds of translations. The Bible says the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us in truth. We, he brings all things to our remembrance. If there's nothing in our rememberer, how can he bring it? Nothing in our head, how can he bring it to our remembrance? So we need to be, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is a good and acceptable uh, worship of God. Yep. Number five, spend time cultivating a love and appreciation for Holy Spirit. Contemplate the engagement with Holy Spirit. Guys, <clears throat> we looked at Galatians chapter five. It says that the spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. They're, they're in opposition one to another. My definition for walking, uh, Paul said, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your old nature, the lust of the flesh. So what does it mean to walk in the spirit? Here's my definition. I've been saying this for 20 years. Being constantly conscious of Holy Spirit. You're conscious of, his, of him being there. You're engaged in conversation with him. You know, scripture says we're supposed to have sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs making melody in our hearts. So there's a sense that you're engaged with the Holy Spirit. That you're talking to the Holy Spirit. You're listening for the Holy Spirit to speak back, at, back with you. you know, there's this, and you know, and it's, it doesn't just have to be in a quiet chair in a quiet place. Driving down the road. Doing stuff that, do, that, that doesn't take your full attention. You know, just minus activities, cutting grass, doing stuff, whatever, washing dishes, whatever. This is robotic kind of stuff that we do that we don't even have to think about, about what we're doing. We can, we can be engaged in him with that in conversation. We have that privilege, man. You guys, if you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We'll say of the Lord, he is my help, he's my strength, he's my life. So guys, you can be as close to that, it's just like any relationship. You know, you can sit at home and watch TV all evening long, night after night, and never have a conversation with your spouse, or you can turn the stupid box off and, and engage in some conversation and get to know them better, be connected. The same thing with the Holy Spirit. Number six, last one. Worship team, come on up. Meditate. Continuously. Meditate continuously. We do, guys. We do. We, you know, we think all kind of thoughts continuously. There's thoughts that are going through our head continuously. Thoughts that are generated by our own mind and imagination. Thoughts that are generated, trying to be portrayed upon our screen by Satan. The Bible says that, are, you know, that, that we, though we live in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. But our battle is what? Bringing every thought and every imagination under the subjection of God's word to the obedience of Christ. So, there, so our, our, our thoughts are engaged all the time. So we need to be, we need to be engaged in healthy spiritual uh, imaginations and healthy spiritual thoughts. We need to meditate continuously on the law of the Spirit, the full work of the Holy Spirit, all that the Holy Spirit does. I'll be meditating upon that and some thought will come to my mind and I'll pull out my iPad or pull out my phone and I do a concordance search of the little phrase and find verses that are, that are speaking to me on that. We need to meditate on the royal law of love. James talks about the royal law of love. If we walk in the royal law of love, we will, be, we will do well. The royal law of love is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your others as yourself. On that, everything hangs. So we have that. The way of the kingdom. You know, the way of the kingdom is different than the way of the world. The economy of the kingdom is different than the economy of the world. You know, we live in a performance-based society. If you perform well, you get your bonus. If you perform well, you get the uh, honor roll if you're way back. We teach kids very early on. You get stars if you perform well. And then you get the, uh, those who get the A's get the scholarship. You get to go off to college, all those kinds of things. We're, that's a performance-based relationship. The kingdom is not. It's, a, it's not a relationship based on performance. So we need to learn the kingdom way. We need to meditate on the character of Jesus. You need to meditate on the character of Jesus. We have to meditate on what Scripture declares about what it means to have Jesus in you and you being in Jesus. We need to meditate. When we come, we we'll find ourselves in impossible situations, saints, we need to engage in meditation with the Holy Spirit to see what the way of escape is. The Bible says there's no temptation too great a man that God doesn't make a way of escape. How are you going to find out what the way of escape is? Holy Spirit's going to give you the insight if you will engage with him and look to him, and not look to yourself, but look to him for that engagement. Let's all stand to our feet.
Last thing I want to tell you you need to do. You need to get closer than you are right now. I'll put both my hands up for that. I need to get closer to Jesus than I do right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for my, for my brothers and my sisters that are here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would stir us. You call us to a higher spot. Lord Jesus, you call each of us up to be closer to you than we are right now, Lord. God, I pray that you put a, a, a Holy Ghost dissatisfaction in our hearts when we allow the carnal pleasures that substitute spiritual joy and spiritual life and spiritual peace. Lord, that we would step out of the darkness and into the light, Lord God. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring uh, powerful conviction upon us. Lord, I pray that those of us that have, that have dullness of hearing to the things of the Spirit, Lord, you would just be merciful, Lord God, and you would increase sensitivity to us. You'd bring uh, conviction upon us in the areas that, need, that we need to, need to deal with, Lord God, those things that we've talked about here this morning. Lord, I pray that each one of us in this place and each one watching online, Lord God, that we would come to the place where, where uh, we have zero tolerance for compromise, zero tolerance for coldness of heart, zero tolerance for, for being critical and being judgmental and all the things that, uh, that come from the works of the flesh. Zero tolerance to the work of the flesh. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your work in our lives that brings about the peaceable fruit of righteousness. We thank you for the work, your work within us that brings about love, joy, peace, goodness, temperance, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, all the fruit of your spirit, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pray with me, saints. Heavenly Father, I want more of you and less of me. Lord Jesus, thank you for my identity in you. Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help me to see myself the way you see me, that I might begin to walk out that new identity that I have in you. Holy Spirit, I want to be closer to you today than I've ever been before. I want to draw close to you. I want to hear your voice. I want to sense your leading. I want to honor you. Holy Spirit, thank you for your relentless pursuit of me and desire for intimacy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord God. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you that it's the work that you've begun. Jesus, I thank you that the work that you've begun in our lives, that you will bring it to completion, Lord. Lord God, I just, Lord, help us. We believe, Lord, help our unbelief. Lord God, we are, we're submitted, help our unsubmission. Lord, we are committed, help our uncommitment. That we might come into full maturity, we might become the manifested sons and daughters of God, that we might be uh, those who walk in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. I just ask, Lord, for a stirring in our hearts, a recommitment to you, a fresh download of your power and your presence in our lives, uh, that we might more perfectly think like you, talk like you, act like you, and represent you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.